Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to the How to Tie Fishing Knot series and today's knot is the Improved Clinch Knot, also known as the Fisherman's Knot. Today I'm out on the water, it's mid-July, these fish are on some deeper brush piles so I normally use this knot when I'm tying on some sort of search bait, um, whether it's a beetle spin, crankbait, or in this case, one of my favorite lures to use both midsummer and into the fall is a lipless crankbait. Vertically jigging these over the top of some brush piles can produce a lot of fish. I'm actually set up on two different brush piles right now behind me, and there are a ton of crappie here. And I'm actually going to bring up a question I want to ask you about fish population in lakes. But we're going to do that in a second. Let's get into actually how to tie the knot. Normally, I like to use uh, either a braid, straight braid to the whatever search bait I'm using, or some sort of braid with uh, a leader, whether it's mono, fluorocarbon. I don't like using monofilament when it comes to search baits anymore. Uh, I just found that braid or fluorocarbon doesn't twist as much. Let's just get into tying the knot. It's a very simple knot. It's probably the first knot I learned how to tie. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna take the tag end, you're gonna put it through, in this case, the O-ring, or if you're using a some sort of hook, you just put it through the eyelid of that bait. You're gonna take about four to five inches of the tag end, pull that through, and you're gonna take your index finger and your thumb of your right hand, you're gonna hold the tag in with that, and then you're gonna take the index finger and your thumb with your left hand and hold the main line going back to your rod tip. You're gonna wrap the tag end while keeping your middle finger between the two lines, creating a loop. You're gonna wrap that tag end around the main line going back to the rod tip. I like to do it five to seven times. Now this is gonna create some sort of spiral around the main line. You're then going to take that tag end and you're going to put it through the loop that you created with your middle finger of your right hand. Now if you just left it here and pulled it tight, that would be called the clinch knot. What makes it improved is that when you pulled that tag end through where the loop is in your middle finger, you actually created a second loop. And you're going to take the tag end and put it back through that second loop, which makes it the improved clinch knot. Now you're going to wet it, and before you slide it down towards the eyelet, or in this case the o-ring, you're going to want to make sure that all those loops kind of stand up vertical. They don't get bunched up. You don't want them bunched up because that could create problems and cause your line to wear, or that knot to wear down and snap. So you're going to slide it all the way down, and there we go. The loop knot is all tied on, and our uh, lipless crankbait is ready to vertically jig on some brush piles here. So. Let's drop it down. I'm going to show you a little bit on the live scope what I'm seeing. There are a ton of fish. And uh, I got a question for you about fish population. We'll get into that. So as you can see, there's a giant pile of fish right there. Absolute pile of fish right above this little brush pile. And there are a ton of them. And I mean a ton of fish. So right now, Got this little red lipless crankbait tied on. I'm gonna drop it down there. To trying to try two different tactics here. One's gonna be a straight vertical jig and kind of popping it. The other's gonna be like a, a vertical or like a yo-yo pattern. And uh, we'll let it kind of swing down into that brush pile or near it and see if we can get some, some fish to bite. All I'm gonna do is just let it drop down to basically where I can see the school and just pop it. And usually what happens is they hit it on the fall, and as I pull back up, I'll feel a lot more weight than just a that lipless crankbait. There they are. There's that school right below the boat. Ah, wraps around the rod tip. These fish are actually moving from brush pile to brush pile. They're not sitting on a single one, and it's because of this right here. I don't know if you can see it, but there's shad busting all over the place. These white bass are pushing these shad to the surface. They're hitting them and that those wounded shad are kind of falling down and these crappie are just sitting underneath suspended and they're chasing that these schools. Looks like they moved to a brush pile a little further away, so I'm gonna flip it out there. Let's see if I can get close enough. There's that brush pile. That's 20 feet out, so I'm just kind of flipping it out, letting it kind of yo-yo back to me. If I didn't have live scope, I would definitely just be throwing buoys on some brush piles and kind of casting in a bunch of different directions because these fish are moving. Question I had 
since I'm, we'll wait till we catch a fish here. But the question I had, as you can see, there's a ton of fish down there. I spun my trolling motor around to see different brush piles and it seems like there's, there, there's easily over a thousand fish on the four or five brush piles that I'm on. But I guarantee there's nothing over like 11 inches down there. They're probably all gonna be eight and a half to nine and a half inch fish. So the question I have for you, and let me know in the comment section what you think about this. In bluegill fishing, we always, I always hear, you know, you gotta keep those seven and a half to eight and a half inch gills but the nine and 10 inch ones go. When you release those bigger gills, it's gonna create more 10 inch bluegill in that whatever system you're fishing in. I'd, I'd assume it's the same for crappie, because right now I think there's just so many crappie in this lake, and it's only about a thousand acres, and all these crappie are eight and a half, nine and a half, you know, something that 10, probably less than 10 inches. All these crappie are less than 10 inches. Most of them are around nine, nine and a half. I just think they're so competitive for food right now that I don't know. I don't know. Can they get big on a thousand acre lake? I'm not talking like a huge river system. Like I know a lot of people fish down south. I'm not talking like Grand Lake or Lake of the Ozarks. We're not talking tens of thousands of acres. This lake is 1000 acres, give or take a hundred. Can crappie, cause this used to be, there used to be some really big crappie in this lake. And it's not because the crappie disappeared. I every brush pile I pull up on, there's at least a couple hundred fish on it. The trouble is getting them to bite. It's midday right now, so it's a little tough, but. So that's my question. How do you manage that to get bigger, bigger class fish? Do you gotta keep all those nine and a half inch fish? Kind of thin it out a little bit? What do you do? Cause we don't, it's not the population problem. Like we're not shortage of crappie on this lake that I fish. I know there's probably some people in the forums that say we are because you know, I've made a few videos on this lake, but I guarantee you they're, just look at this. Look at that right there. I mean, there's, there's easily 100, 150 fish on that one brush pile alone. And that's a small brush pile. There he is. There he is. Oh, yep, see that's another. He's about a nine inch fish. They're all cookie cutters. But there are a ton of them down there. And they're fun to catch too, especially lipless crankbaits, any type of search bait pattern where you can mix it up where you're not just kind of holding that jig right in front of their nose. Don't get me wrong, that's fun too at times, but if you're fishing with kids and they kind of you know, want to cast something out but also they need to vertically jig something. They can do it with this. There he is. Oh, and I got the dink. I got the dink. The first two were Definitely bigger than this guy. Easy. You do have to be careful. You got two treble hooks going on here. This is only about a five and a half inch fish. That is the question. Is there is it possible for crappie to there be too many small crappie? Because I think that's what happened in this lake. I used to be able to catch 11, 12 inch fish. They're still in here, but it's rare. It's rare. You don't believe me that there's a lot of crappie in this lake? Look at that. All of these, there's probably some bait fish pushed up there, but most of those are all eight, nine inch crappie right there. Just a ton of them. Absolute ton of fish. Look at all that. I mean, there's thousands of fish there. Right below the boat too. <laughs> See if we can catch one. Oh, they're hitting it on the fall. There he is, got him. Hit it on the drop. Ooh, that's a better one. I might be here, oh, and he, damn it. I was trying to get you that second camera angle and he flipped off. That was a little bit better fish. That might've been that 10 incher. Sorry folks, we're not gonna catch any 15s today. It's all right. 
That's the other problem we have that maybe a lot of you, if you fish down south, you don't have a whole lot of issues with. Uh, we'll have really good sized crappie, but the problem is one year they'll be on one lake, the next year they'll be on the next, and it, if you only have five, six lakes to fish from, that's not a big deal. The problem is uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, Minnesota is known as the land of 10,000 lakes. There's actually 11,000 lakes, a little over 11,000 lakes in Minnesota and a little over 11,000 in Wisconsin as well. So uh, the problem we run into is you really got to fish almost every single lake until you find them. And that means fishing lakes like this size, a thousand acre lake, you have to fish lakes that are 50 acres. There's a fish. In order to find the good, good sized schools. And that can take a while, it really can. So, and a quarter. That's pretty much what they're gonna be down there. Let's see if we can get one more out of this school. But that is kind of the issue fishing up north versus some of the, I mean, I fished in Oklahoma, I fished in Texas. Texas has a lot of lakes, don't get me wrong. Uh, but the other issue we have is it's only six month growing season. I mean, we have ice on our lakes for almost six months out of the year a lot of times. And those fish really don't get the full growing season that they do down south. Our fish that we catch that are 12 inches those fish could be twice as old as a, a white crappie from Oklahoma that's 12 inches. Just takes a lot longer for those fish to grow to that certain size class. The struggles of a northern crappie fisherman. Had to vent a little bit. There he is. Got one that time. That is gonna end it for this video. Not big fish, obviously. This is probably one of those, one of those smaller guys. That's musky bait right there. That's what that is. Musky love these guys. So that's gonna wrap it up for the improved clinch knot using these lipless crankbaits. You can also tie them on some regular trolling style crankbaits or search baits, beetle spins, underspins, uh, bladed, bladed jigs like the uh, chatterbait, the micro chatterbait stuff. This is one of those knots you can tie on your search baits. Um, you could also probably tie it on for minnows. I wouldn't recommend. There's probably a couple other knots I'd recommend for minnows, but this is one of those knots alongside the Palomar knot and the Uni knot. Try it out, see if you'll like it. If this is one of those that's really easy for you to tie, I highly encourage you to use it. It's probably, this is the first knot I learned how to tie. And probably a lot of you out there, if this is your first knot that you learned how to tie, comment below, let me know. So that's gonna wrap it up for me. I hope you enjoyed the video in this how to tie fishing knot series. More to come, stay tuned. See ya.